Welcome back to The Jews Next Door, where we are raising the next generation of passionate and committed Jews. I'm Rabbi Irman Shell, and today we are talking about disciplining without yelling. We are the ones who are yelling down at our children. I say we're yelling down at our grandchildren. If you're like most parents, you may have yelled at your child, you know, once or maybe twice, maybe a bit more than that. In this episode, Sarah Khan Radcliffe, a psychologist and author of so many parenting books and truly a parenting expert, will teach us what is so bad about yelling at our children, and most importantly, how to stop doing it. Without further ado, enjoy the episode. This week's guest is Mrs. Sarah Khanna Radcliffe. Mrs. Radcliffe is a registered member of the College of Psychologists of Ontario, practicing marriage, parenting, and individual counseling for over 40 years. She is the author of No More Ticks, Raise Your Kids Without Raising Your Voice, Better Behavior Now, The Fear Fix, Harmony at Home, and six other books on family life and emotional well-being. Sarah Khanna is also a weekly columnist and international lecturer, presenting keynotes and workshops in family life, personal stress management, and she's the creator of Daily Parenting Post email list, which offer parenting education on and, and also offers parenting education on her Instagram and Facebook pages. Sarah Khanna Radcliffe's books, webinars, and other as supportive educational products for family life and personal well-being can be found at her Daily Parenting Post website, which I will include in the episode notes. And I want to say a major thank you. It's such a pleasure to have you on, such a parenting expert, such a some, someone who's dealing with so much parenting at all times. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Okay. So first things first, what, what inspired you to get involved specifically, you know, with, with parenting amongst the other things that you, that you can so about? Actually, my work in psychology with people who were harmed by their developmental journeys um, was very inspirational because I think that instead of concentrating on how to fix people's, you know, wounded souls, uh, the best thing to do is to help parents who love their children use the techniques that won't accidentally cause any kind of harm, ideally, as much as possible. I think everything starts young. So if we can uh, help parents be the most skilled they can be, then um, we're giving people the best start that they can have in life. What is that? Like, how do you, how do you get to that best start? What's the, what's the keys to success for that? <laughs> well, I know that's a loaded question. <laughs> I, I actually think education is really important because we do, we're all human and we all have our feelings that get in the way of our brains when we're, I don't know, it's a hard, long day. You know, kids aren't listening or cooperating or they're fighting with us or with each other or something. And when we feel helpless, then we just revert to our most primitive, you know, strategies. Like we're just going to try and force the issue, get that kid into the bath, get him into bed, force him to do his homework, yell at him, whatever. I don't know. Where if we don't know, what our alternatives are. Mm. We end up doing things that can cause harm, even though our intention is to help the child function better right. and do the right thing. Mm. Parents who really don't know that, I mean, obviously there are parenting books. How, how, what's the best way for them to, to find out that information? Well, like you say, there are parenting books and there's parenting courses and there's private parenting consultations. And right. actually today we have more support for parents than ever before, you know, like right, right. everybody's onto this, but these, the kind of support that we need has to address when I say education, I mean, both cognitive education, that is knowing what to do, when to do it, how to do it, but also emotional education, um, knowing what to do with ourselves when we're, we have all our feelings that impact upon the parenting scene, our fear, our panic, our anger, our frustration, our helplessness. These things we also need to know what to do about because otherwise we won't be able to use anything we ever read in a book. For mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Right. I noticed that a lot of your work has to do a lot with like managing anger, keeping the temperature in the home as good as possible. Why would you say that that's so important before, before everything else? Well, it is key to preventing certain kinds of uh, long-term harm. And uh, what I mean by that is that when we, let's say, yell at our children, if we're, if we're the ones who are angry, because it could be any member of the family, right? Uh, our, we could be angry, our child could be angry, so their partner could be angry. But anyways, let's say we're the ones who are yelling down at our children. I say we're yelling down at our grandchildren as well, mm, because wow. we're installing a program in the child's brain the child's learning what constitutes an emergency. You know, is it spilt milk? Um, is it forgetting your homework? Is it, uh, you know, being rude? What constitutes an emergency? And we see the parent's reaction and that gets fried into the child's brain. And even if the child doesn't want to be like the parent, very often the child 
you know, you open your mouth and, and your mother's voice comes out. Yeah. And so you, didn't, you didn't want it to happen like that. Right, right, right. Um, also, the damage to the parent-child relationship is very great when there's anger that comes. If, the, if anger is the parenting tool of choice, like, you know, if you don't do this, I'm going to get mad. Okay, now I'm mad. Now you better do it. You know, if, if anger is the tool, in the end, the the child and parent are not going to get along very well. We We can't like love, be close to someone who's got that mad face, that rejecting face, that critical voice, um, those harsh words coming at us all the time. So right, right. that will be harmful. And But the child needs a very close relationship with the parent in order to have um, his or her most uh, optimal developmental you know, future there that we need to feel loved. We need to feel accepted. We need to feel cherished. And anger undoes all of that. Right. That's I really love it, how you frame that. It's such a powerful... Thing of the like when you yell at your children, you're yelling at your grandchildren, and you're teaching your children the way to react to their future children. That's uh, that's such a powerful idea. I actually just recently heard an idea from uh, from Rav Chaim Kanievsky that when uh, when when Esav was bringing the food to Yitzchak, it says via Vela Aviv, and he points out that that's it's it's actually a palindrome. If you you, you read it backwards, why is that? He says because the way that a, that a child a parent treats their child is the way that they're going to be, that that child is going to be treated by their children, which is exactly what you're saying. And, and it's, it's mm-hmm. such a powerful idea. Wow. So, you know, going forward with that, because of the fact that, you know, everyone gets, has frustrations, you know, with their children, with, you know, it's just, it's, it's natural to come up. There are things yeah. that children are going. So how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you lessen your anger or how do you deal when your child is angry? Meaning there's, there's two people who could be angry here. Like you mentioned, there's either sometimes your anger that you're feeling so frustrated by the way that your child is acting or, or just, or you came in with from a bad day or whatever it is, or sometimes your child is just, you know, throwing a tantrum, super angry right now, not happy with the, with the no that you you said no, or not happy with the fact that you said it's bath time or the fact that you said it's time to do homework or whatever it is. So how do you, how do you deal with those situations? Well, first of all, you're, you're raising a good point about the child that equally important for the child's anger to be curved. I think what happened is that you know, maybe a generation or so ago, we worried about the parents' anger. Now, people have been taking a lot of courses and reading books and stuff. And a lot of times we see parents who have actually um, developed a skill set that causes them to listen and you know empathetically to their child and to support the child. So parents are doing well. Um, a lot more often, but they've gone too far in that they don't feel comfortable in guiding the child and how to control his anger. There's a theory out there that if we're supportive enough and nice enough, then the child will automatically um, be emotionally regulated, meaning calm and able to express himself and trusting and so on, which is only true for a small percentage of children, in my opinion, that, you know, there's a lot of children out there who need guidance, I would say, you know, 90% of children are going to need something more than our emotional support in order for them to learn how to um, control their own anger. And it's critical for their future happiness that they do learn that skill because they're going to get married. And these days, nobody puts up with an angry partner. They just right, divorce. Right. That's it. That. Yeah. Um, and of course, their own relationship with their children and their ability to succeed in the workplace. But mostly it's the intimate relationships. When you don't, when the child grows up without learning how to manage his own feelings um, behaviorally. So as we have feelings, but what we do with them is the behavior. Okay? So we can all feel that anger. Then we need some skill set um, to do something about that. Both the parent needs it and the child needs it. Otherwise, the child will be practicing for 20 developmental years, a very poor skill of expressing rage and um, the parents love him, but nobody else will ever love him that much. <laughs> so um, it won't work for him in his life to right. be able to, to do that. So the skills involve um, being able to identify feelings, which is important. Um, that, that's why it's important for the parent to be able to name the child's feelings, name the parent's own feelings, mm. have what, what I call an emotional vocabulary. So yes, I understand you're you're angry at me because I said, no, I know you're disappointed because you really wanted to do such and such. And I know that it's frustrating. This is something actually that earlier parents never did. They never named feelings. Okay? Right. So like I said, more modern parents uh, tend to do that and only that. Okay, right. um, Meaning they stay in stage one, but they don't necessarily know how to go to stage two. Yeah. So you know, meanwhile, the kid is throwing things at you. And <laughs> so 
and we're waiting for him to calm down because we love him so much. And like I said, that's not my preferred way of doing it. But the child needs like. Once we're in the fight or flight response, which we are, if we're yelling, certainly if we're throwing things or stamping our feet, if we're saying things that we that aren't very nice, that they're disrespectful. So the fight or flight response shuts down the prefrontal cortex um, where all our rules about what to say and how to behave are located. This is why full grown adults who do quite well at work and always control themselves come home and scream at each other in their marital relationship. And some people are not screamers. Some people just do other things. They shut down, they sulk, they just say uh, unkind things under their breath. They get hostile in different ways. Right. But that's why we do it with our partners, even though we have tremendous self-control in other settings. If once the fight or flight, once we're triggered, we lose our ability to access all the good rules of fair communication, respectful right. communication, and so on, proper negotiation skills. So the first thing to do is learn how to exit from a conversation that is not working and to return to take it up when your esteem has is gone and you're able to now apply the rules of good communication. Right. And there are rules, you know, like um, expressing what you want from a person, for example, is far more important than expressing what they did wrong. So, you know, we don't need an upfront lecture about, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> what the person's doing wrong. And so asking for what we want in a short way and being very specific. My little book, Better Behavior Now, uh, which was published by Manucha Publishers and available mostly in Jewish bookstores and uh, on Amazon in the US. That is really a very concise uh, guide on how to help children um, get to the point where they will say the right speak to us about their feelings, about what they want and hear us and negotiate with us with a lot of uh, respect and the way they're supposed to, especially as a Jewish child, you know, there's Hashem has his rules also about what a child is supposed to be able to say to a parent. And, you know, a lot of times if we just actually apply the the Torah's laws, you know, the child is not allowed to tell a parent anything, for example, like, no, I'm not having a bath. That's actually, you know, forbidden according to Halakha. You know, it's more you know, mommy, would it be okay if I didn't have a bath tonight? Mm -hmm. And that, you know, wisdom, of course, in Torah, it always outshines any psychological, secular wisdom that we'll ever encounter. Because when you ask a question, you're immediately thrown into a respectful and um, self-controlled mode. Would it be possible for me to skip the bath tonight? You know, calms the child down and puts him in the right place. Mm. Rather than, you know, no, I'm not doing that, whatever. That, they're not in the fight and flight at that point, right? Meaning that's already, that's a, that's a different stage already, no? Or you're saying so that's how- a little, to, a little bit before, honey, it's time for bath. Um, no, I don't want a bath. Okay. Um, no, sweetie, tonight's Monday, it's bath night. Yeah. I'm not having a bath. Okay, so it depends on how fast some kids go from zero to hundred really fast. You know, right. the parent needs to recognize, you know, for some parents that will be really triggering just that little interchange and the parent will catch the fire and go like, um, we're not discussing it. Okay. Get your, get yourself into the bathroom right now. You know, the parent will start to escalate also, which of course is the worst thing uh, in terms of a parenting technique. Right. The parent has to be, have to, has to be able to um, stay in the um, parental, uh, you know, very grown up. I'm in charge. I can do this kind of thing. Um, right. No, honey, um, it is Monday. It's, it is bath night and uh, we're going to go. And to understand that the, her own voice, his own voice is regulating the child. So we don't, you know, it's very important that we don't catch on fire, but that them, because we don't want to catch the child's fire. Okay. We want him to catch our calm. Right. So right, we have to right. keep everything down. And there's something I call the two times rule, which is to help prevent the parent from getting to a point where the parent is on fire. So you have to, you come by and say, okay, now it's time to close your book, you know, get ready for bed. And then come back in a few minutes, the kid's still reading. Honey, I told you it's time to close the book. Come on, it's, it's bedtime. You know, and come back a few minutes later, the kid's still reading. So like, I'm going to rip that book out of your hand, throw it out the window. You know, like it depends on how, again, on how fast okay. the parent also yeah. escalates. But the 10 times rule is that the parent asks him nicely and nicely and nicely and nicely. And by the end of it, smoke is coming out of his ears, you know, and he's screaming and yelling at the kid because he's had it. So okay. the problem with using the 10 times rule is that, the child only learns to listen to you when you're at a certain pitch of hysteria. Mm. So the two times rule says we never get even close to that. Okay. We ask the child once and then we evaluate for ourselves whether we should ask again. 
where they were, <laughs> um, because we can, we can just drop it. And now the kid can stay up all night or never have his bath or not eat his dinner, whatever it is. Like maybe this isn't where we want to put um, our fork down in the battle. So you're saying, you're saying two times is you ask once and if they're not evaluate. listening. And then evaluate. Uh-huh. Okay. If you want to proceed, you'll ask a second time, but the second time will contain a warning. So it's like a choice. If you want to call it a choice, so that makes you feel better about a consequence. You know, <laughs> we don't say punishment because, you know, we're not, not trying to, you know, punish the, the psyche of a child. But let's say this. We, I asked you a few minutes ago to close the book and, you know, go to bed. And you know, if, if I, when I come back in a couple of minutes, see that you're still reading, then blah, blah, blah. Okay. Some kind of deterrent. If you're looking for a great way to have some good, clean, kosher fun with your children through the powerful effect of music, look no further because Jay Karaoke is here. Jay Karaoke gives one and all the platform to belt out their favorite tunes from a library of thousands of Jewish songs, hundreds of artists, and genres across multiple decades of incredible Jewish music. Personally, I know that I love singing. I love it. I love karaoke, but I was really never able to get into it because it wasn't the Jewish songs. And that's where Jay Karaoke comes in with their huge selection from the latest hits to the classics. They even have nursery rhymes for your little ones. And with features like key changes to help you sing, to make you more comfortable as you're singing and speeding it up or slowing down the song, they have really thought of everything. To enjoy Jewish karaoke your way, all you need to do is head to jkaraoke.com. Choose a subscription that fits for you. And to make it even more fun, you could purchase their state of art karaoke kit, which gives you the feeling as if you are today's top singer. You can insert whoever you feel it is. Connect your kit to any device, like it could be a laptop, a computer, a tablet, whatever it is. And you plug in your speaker, plug in your J Karaoke microphone, and you sing away. It's as easy as that. That's all it is. And it's really fun. I checked out their website. It really looks amazing. They have an incredible, incredible amount of song selection. Anything you want. They got Thank You Hashem. They got Mordechai Shapiro. They really got it all. You can subscribe monthly for just $4.99 a month yearly for $49.99 and we have a special deal here for you for any of our listeners if you use the code Jews next door d-o-r you get an additional 10% off and if you don't want your children to be using a device with internet J karaoke has got you covered you can download the app onto your desktop once you have it up turn off the internet let them sing all day long without the internet check out J karaoke today and let the fun begin uh, we wish, and we, I don't know why we think that children would be able to do better than adults when it comes to deterrence. For example, the police could, could ask us, you know, please don't park in spaces for more than an hour. Give everybody a turn. Okay, so just leave. Or right. please don't, don't, don't drive too fast because it's not safe on the road. So, you know, like even adults with all our brain capacity learn better if there's a huge fine and we're going to move the car and we're, we're going to drive slower, whatever it is. Like even we need deterrence. I think that a child will just understand the wisdom that you're, you know, like, you know, we need our sleep. Okay, for, you know, there is a place and a quiet place that keeps the parents sane. Um, because helplessness, that is, I'm asking and asking and giving you all the rationales in the world, and explaining everything to you, and still you're not cooperating. You know, again, different children have different inborn tendencies to be cooperative or uncooperative. There, so some some kids are like, okay, do I, you know, that's their nature, right? And uh, other kids are, they can't do anything anybody asks them ever. You know, so and there's everybody in between. So right, right. we just need to um, keep ourselves in the parental position. It's like, like I'm, I'm controlling all the pleasures and all the access to the books and everything that you've got in life. And I'm really not worried about this. If you, you know, don't want to listen to me, that's fine. You have free will, but there will be a cost, you know, to that. And then you can make a, a different decision tomorrow night. If you didn't like that cost, you're like, but, right, right. But, but even that the two times world, that's really to keep the parent calm. Okay. And in charge and mm. sane. but it's the last thing that we would use in my book, better behavior. Now, there's a, a, a ton of techniques that have nothing to do with discipline, okay? They have everything to do with um, wiring the child's brain towards cooperation. Mm. And that is not an inborn natural technique that we're going to have. There's nothing. Everything that we do naturally would be anti that uh, skill. So just for example, if a kid is sitting at the table and he's, uh, I don't know, he's eating his food with his hands. The natural thing to do for a parent is to say, um, honey, use your fork. Okay. 
So, but the problem, as that book explains from a neurological point of view, is the fact that the parent speaks to the child while the child is doing something incorrectly causes the wiring for the incorrect behavior to get stronger because any kind of attention to a behavior um, that we're doing wires that behavior and more, which is why if you clap for somebody, they'll be doing better at whatever you clap for. And if you give them- Even though you're giving specifically a negative saying, I I don't want you to do that, please use your fork. Why would that, why would that- I I actually urge every parent to read (laughs) Better Behavior Now because they're, like I said, nothing intuitive, nothing intuitive about it and everything that is intuitive goes against it. So what we're trying to do is like when the child picks up the fork, you know, then we should go like, wow, who's eating like a little gentleman there? That's great. You know, like that's when we should talk. Mm -hmm. But we tend to talk, of course, when the child is needs correction. Uh Um, And not just like the concept of catching them doing good as opposed to pointing out when they're doing wrong. It is that, but much more. It it is that essentially, but much more. So there's um, a technology for um, getting the desirable behavior um, to occur. That's really what we want to do. And we don't want to use punishment. We want to use um, joyful, happy, you know, parenting to get to that point. But it's not about being generally loving. It's about targeting um, the target behaviors is what I call them. Like if you, if a child is doing something that you don't like, that's a, I'll call it loosely a problem behavior. And then what we're after is the target behavior. And that it's very, very specific about what we need to do to get to that target behavior and then how to build that target behavior into the child's brain Mm -hmm. so that it's just natural for the child to do it. But it's not just that we do. I'm trying to think of some of the other techniques we have in that book. Uh, First of all, speaking to the target behavior, but the natural things that we're doing are, um, I'm just trying to think of a few more examples for you. I should have really had that in mind. Right. Uh, let's let's just talk it'll come to it'll come to me it's like because there's uh, but i'll just say it's a short it's a short book it's not a hard read but if you get that right um it'll be your job will be so much easier that's all i'll say (laughs) so going going back to a couple of things that you were saying before you know one one of the things you mentioned is that uh, you know when when you're in that frustration can i interrupt you can i interrupt you for a second because i just had an example that's important You know, parents will do this sort of thing too. Um, the child will, let's say, punch his brother or, you know, grab the toy. So the parent will say to the child, you know, we don't punch, right? We don't hit in this house. Or all behaviors, all instructions that uh, involve stop and don't and not, these negative words. The problem is they're actually followed by the instruction, the word to do, okay, where we don't hit. We give these lectures. We might even sit down with the child and give them a five minute talk about the importance of getting along and and brotherly love and all these things. As we're doing that, we're simply wiring in the incorrect behavior. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of little details like that that are natural to us um, to do it the wrong way. (laughs) And and then we wonder, how come? I, I You know, no matter how many times I tell him that he's, you know, can't use his hands, he's still... You know, it's also like the, what you were saying the before. The only way to get the behavior into the child's brain is for the child to do it. So even the talk, even if the parent had said, we don't hit, we use our hands. Do you understand me? We use our hands. Is that clear? Now, nothing's happened to the child's brain because the next time his sibling bothers him, the brain wiring is already, you know, punch, grab, you know, whatever he does. Right. The only way to change that brain wiring is the same way we'd get a person to learn how to write the alphabet, okay? So if I tell you, well, we write an A by putting three lines, you know, a capital A has three lines in it. Do you understand? Do you, do you know now how to write an A? It's okay. <laughs> the only way you're going to write an A is when you, <laughs> your a. when you practice your A, if that movement from your hand goes into your brain, your brain produces a neural pathway for it. And then you'll be able to use that neural pathway. And the more you practice, the faster that neural pathway will run. Um, so the more you practice it, the better you'll get at your A. Same uh-huh. thing with what we do with our brother. Okay, when you want his toy, you need to ask him. Let's practice that right now. Okay, I want you to ask him for the toy. That's the only way the brain can get the first neural pathway laid down. Mm-hmm. So that practice point hardly ever happens naturally. Okay. Right, like right. this is something you have to know. And once the child is practicing, then we, we do something called rapid wiring 
because the um, the first wire has been laid down. But that's a little weak wire. He has probably millions of wires for punch that guy out. So he has this one little weak wire that you put like, can I please have my toy? You know, so <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to supercharge that by adding more wires ourselves. So I think of it this way. If we say to the kid, great, you asked him, you used your words and you asked him for the toy. That's exactly what you're supposed to do. Those words, while you're looking at the child, is going to add 50 more wires. But mm-hmm. if you give that child gold, okay, you can add a thousand wires. So at first in the rewiring program, we are going to give them gold. So we say, and because you asked so nicely, such and such reward for both of you, boom, the brain explodes. Okay. The right. brain now goes, I got to do that again. Okay. And puts a lot of wires in. Okay. So but how do you, three- how do you do that without them being then stuck on wait, wait, but I did it right again. I, I want the chocolate or I want the lollipop or whatever, it, like whatever you're giving them. How do you so, get? So, so, so there is a weaning process and it's all spelled out in the book. I'm, <laughs> exactly. You know, like uh, we're not rewarding every, we're not getting that boom every time. Right. right. The initial one to get, because you need to fight the competing circuit that's already in place for that trigger. The trigger is the brother's got the toy. Okay. So the circuit is grab it, punch him, whatever you need to do. You're building a new circuit, but the old circuit has call it millions of wires on it. All right. So your new circuit, you for that rapid start on the new circuit, you will be giving that boom a few times up front in a very, you know, it's a very special way. Read the book and you'll see exactly how it's done. And then we'll wean off. But that comment label, comment label, like we now see the child in real life doing it. You ask him for the toy. Wow, that's phenomenal. Okay. That's, that shows um, what, what, you know, what a great communicator you are, you know, mm. like, or whatever. Okay. It's all spelled out there, but that is right, the right. essence. And yeah. that is the technique that we want to be using all day long because it's 100% positive. It's relationship building. And it is the technique that rewires the brain for the desirable behavior, which right. is really what we want. We want the child to be appropriate in a million different ways, healthy totally. and you know, behaviorally appropriate. And whatever. Right. Right. So uh, just to get back to one of the things that you mentioned before, we were talking about like once the child is in the fight and flight situation. So you, you, you mentioned that to, to say to them at that time, like, I'm going to, you know, I, I, I want you to do this, or I want you to calm down. And then I'm going to wait for you to calm down. That's, that's not the right way to do it. So what is that? Once anybody's in the fight or flight, it's a write off. Okay. So, right, so, so how do you get them out of the fight or flight? You know, the child is upset. He runs to his room. He slams the door. Don't follow him. <laughs> You know, so let him calm down. If he's kicking you, you you know, and he's small enough, you'll have to, you know, remove him. If he's kicking you, he's big enough. You'll have to remove yourself. But most of what a child is doing when they're in the fight or flight is just making a big racket that's rather unpleasant. And you can usually wait it out. Now, some kids with the various diagnostic characteristics, uh, some kids with ADHD or some kids with real self-regulation problems, emotional anger problems that are, you know, will fit into some category. They may scream for an hour. But most kids will scream for a few minutes and just wait it out. Okay? And you wait it out until this, not only that the screaming is over, but that the kid is in a better mood and we're going to come back and do the training. Okay? Mm. That, was, that was rather an unpleasant scene before when you were yelling at me. Let's, this could even be for a teenager, um, you know, like, or for a nine-year-old or whatever, you know, the kid is yelling, saying he hates you. He's saying he, you're the worst parent ever. He doesn't want to live with you. Um, you know, a big, big mouth. Keep your mouth shut when somebody is raging at you because you don't want to just, you'll just be adding fuel to the fire. If right. You, right. So, yeah. Um, and you wait, you wait it out unless you need to call the police. You know? so just, <laughs> wait, just wait it out and uh, the noise will stop. Got it. And then you'll come back to the issue. And so that, that was another thing I wanted to ask you about when you said, like you, you mentioned before, like when you're in the heat of the moment, you know, you have to know how to exit a conversation and then come back when you're ready to. But some people, you know, no matter how much time they wait, when they come back in, they, the, the emotions just get going right away again for sometimes for children or for the parent. How does how does one either deal with the, the child's emotions at that time or even their own emotions at that time to to say, OK, well, I, like. I'm so, I'm so emotionally, you know, enraged again. Like I maybe I'm not ready for this conversation. Then, you know, like this you problem is more characteristic of adults actually than children. Like when children right. calm down and they turn on and turn off more um, readily and they forgive their parents and they need their parents very badly. Um, right. So the child is not so likely to come back screaming, but adults are very likely to come back and get re-triggered from the conversations and a little bit of, uh, third party intervention can fix that for a lifetime. So it's worth it, you know, like to go for short term counseling, say, look, when we, we can't resolve our, our uh, issues because we just both get too upset about it. 
and and have the proper third party intervention for a short time. It's not for the rest of your life until you learn that you it's safe to come back and you have better skills for coming back and you know what to expect. So this is very, very important because it, the marriage is also a parenting tool. That's a chapter in, in my book, Raise Your Kids Without Raising Your Voice. Right. Marriage is a parenting tool. So when the kids are watching you scream at each other, they are learning how to fight with a spouse. So, you know, it is an important thing to do, not just for yourself, but for the kids who live with you, who are right, absorbed right. their marriage like osmosis there. They're just like, they're breathing it in and they're learning what to do with a spouse. Right. So, um, yeah, a little bit of counseling because it's so complicated for us, okay, why adults get triggered. You know, our spouse, it, it may have uh, very little to do with the spouse, everything to do with our upbringing, or it may be that the spouse themselves is usually, you know, uh, a perfect trigger for us for everything. <laughs> uh, but we need um, more than just that instruction to like, okay, calm down, come back. It's not enough. We're very, we're complicated. We need right, a lot right. of Right, right. So, you know, speaking more about the, you know, the parents' angers or emotions at that time, how, how can a parent, you know, like, like you were just saying, when they raise their voices, and I know you have a whole book on it, when, when a parent is, is raising their voices, it's, it's so bad for, for the children, not just because of the, because of the home, but also for the children to see. So what, what in the moment, like what practical advice can you give for how a parent can in the moment say, okay, I need to, I can't raise my voice right now. It's not going to be effective anyways, but right now I, I'm, I'm so upset. I can't believe that they did X, Y, and Z. What, what is know, a, I spoke to a, um, a woman recently who comes from a culture where uh, people yell. It's okay. She's some, from some country on the other side of the world. Where people right. yell and everybody in her family yelled and she was raised as a yeller. Now, the important relationship she has, uh, and she's in her mid-50s, are, are severely damaged. You know, her kids don't talk to her. Her mm. marriage is not really a marriage. Um, she has a lot of problems, but she wants to stop this yelling. Right? So she's calling for help. Now, what works for children works for us, too. That deterrent thing, you know, I, I just said, I asked her for a couple of things that she would hate to have to do. <laughs> Like so apparently things like cleaning cupboards or washing dishes is like way <laughs> beyond this woman's, um, which just never wants to do that. She, right, right. She hates everything domestic, but worst of all, it would be to bake a cake, for example, you know, it's okay, fine. So we make, we make uh, a deal, you know, you raise your voice, you bake a cake, you know, and you give it to the person that you yelled at, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> Actually, even though she was in her fifties, this cured her within a couple of weeks. Just, wow. you know, just, yeah, because if you, are willing if there's part of you that really wants this to be cured and you're willing to help yourself with by accepting upon yourself because you're the one who's going to have to discipline yourself you can't right, say like right. oh, that, that wasn't really a yell i mean that was really his fault so that that was doesn't one that one doesn't count you know like you can't do it like that if you yell for whatever reason you give yourself that discipline start off small because um you have you know in middle age zillions of wires for that for that trigger Mm -hmm. You're going to explode. You're going to be explosive. But bring in increasing, that'll be, you know, a fine of, um, you know, $100 to charity. And the second week, the fine is $250. And the third week, it's, you know, $750. And the fifth right, week, right. it's, you know, charity benefits and you're getting poor. So, you know, like if you are willing to carry it out, that is one thing that you can do for yourself. I actually recommend for both parents and children the use of a harmless little remedy, uh, it's called Bach flower remedies. It's actually Bach flower remedies are the basis of um, the treatment for the book I wrote on tick disorders, um, mm -hmm. little blinking, you know, um, body movements and sounds that people make, uh, typically developing in children around the age of I don't know, between you know, five and nine, somewhere in their average of seven years old. Mm -hmm. Kids start making these little movements or sounds. It's a neurological issue that just runs in some families and this sometimes develops into full-blown Tourette's disorder but anyways the in treating people with Bach flower remedies I found accidentally that they very often cure the tick disorder so wow. if there's anybody who has a kid who has uh, any of these coughing repetitive coughing or 
you can read the book. It's called No More Ticks. Okay. Right, right. I want to make sure to post all of your books, all the links to all your books. Because yeah. this is this is incredible. The, the your your <laughs> your knowledge here is this is uh wow, it's it's fascinating, amazing. amazing. So mock flowers help they remove tick disorders in an amazing way because uh, there's very little that helps a tick disorder. The doctors really cannot help a tick disorder. It's right. it's uh, until we get to it's, the tick disorder is so um crippling. At that point, we'll use medicines that are that have tremendous amounts of side effects and stuff. But right. in between that, and you know, there's nothing. And meanwhile, we can get rid of it. It turns out, you know, with the Bach flowers. Now, Bach, that's B A C H. Uh, he was a doctor, Doctor Edward Bach, and died in 1936. And in England, um, he developed this water-based remedy. It's not herbal, so. Mm-hmm. It, it, and it's not homeopathic. It's its own thing. It's it's a, called a flower re- essence, a flower remedy. And the whole thing sounds bizarre. Yeah. That it should, it's so interesting. You know, the way I got into it is that one of my own children had a phobia uh, when he was very little. A phobia of robbers and, um, mm. uh, kidnapping, you know, robbers and kidnappers. The bedtime thing that a lot of kids have. Right, the difference right. them that he was little, but it, it, it just um, would not stop. It just grew and grew and grew so that, you know, he wouldn't, he wasn't able to go to sleep at night. And then, you know, wow. he'd start after dinner and then after school and then during school and all day. And it went on for two years. I used every regular technique in the book wow. that I knew about as a psychologist. Um, nothing helped him. I had him on a waiting list for a psychiatrist. I just felt this kid, small as he was, was going to have to go on medication. It was disrupting us. And I remembered that somebody had told me about these Bach flower remedies um, decades before. Mm. And it, the whole thing sounded crazy to me at the time. I just laughed. You know, like, oh, yeah, okay, good. Enjoy yourself with that, you know. But I remembered there was one for phobias. And I went to the health food store and I saw that the, this little pamphlet had said, like, for phobias of robbers. I said, that's it, you know. I wow. came home and gave, gave two drops of this to my kid. And he woke up the next day, this is after two years, and the, the whole thing was gone. The, oh. the whole, whole thing was gone. And that's I signed it. crazy. Wow. It is crazy. It is crazy. And shortly after that, a person came to me with their, about their kid who had severe, severe Tourette's disorder. And the kid has been all over um, the world, all over the world trying to get treatments for it. But nobody could help him. He was very, very ill. And they said they heard I had something. I, I can't <laughs> remember how they But I, I said, look, I don't know. I don't know anything about tick disorders. And I don't know if this thing would work, but it's very cheap if you want to try it. <laughs> right. And, and it's harmless. It's great for children. Anyways, it completely cured his thing within a couple huh. of days. I kept wow. in touch with the family for 20 years. It never came back. That is and crazy. Yes. Wow. So that's how yes. you came to develop your book on it? Yes. Yes. Anyways, for adult anger. Okay. Yeah. If a person is quick tempered or hot tempered, or if the child is, there are 38 different remedies in that system of Bach flowers and everybody gets their own little mix that they make. So um, mm. the child can take it or the parent can take it. Um, and they'll find that instead of being so, you know, um, reactive or having so much trouble with the word no or whatever it like, there's very specific ones. And actually anybody who has wants to use box flowers for anything can read my book, No More Ticks, because the book gives a very clear definition of mm. box flowers. Wow. Amazing. Okay. That's, uh, that's amazing. M- moving into a slightly different topic. A lot of times parents are not sure necessarily how to deal with when, when a child's self-esteem or self-image is, is low. What's the, what, what would you say is the best way to help them have a more positive self-image or to how to deal with their feelings of insecurity in different areas of their life? You're talking about, uh, oh, self-esteem now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So self-esteem, it's really an interesting one because some kids are born with a vulnerability in that area right. and kind of put into it through excessive parental criticism or negative feedback. Um, and others acquire it through uh, difficult social interactions with peers. Like how do you know which is which? Mean, yeah, like, how well, do you know if your it, child is, is natural or if it was because something that you did or, you know, like it's. The naturally sensitive ones, you know, like the, the ones that are, have a timid nature and all of these things can actually be aided also by Bach flowers. For example, a child who he can't, he's, he is afraid to try or he gets very, very upset when he fails. Uh, like other kids are just like, I don't care. Like it didn't work out, you know, but for some kids it's like, you know, it ruined their life that they got a low mark right. or that um, their tower that they're building collapsed. Mm-hmm. You know, you can see it in the nature and you can use the Bach 
uh, remedies to help slowly correct that nature. Uh-huh. It's interesting because there's nothing else that I know of that corrects um, personality traits. Okay. You yourself can only help by naming feelings, naming feelings, you know, um, that was hard for you. That was upsetting. You feel bad about that. Um, that was disappointing. Um, it's exasperating, building a feeling vocabulary. Always. Why, why does that help though? I know it. it <laughs> because it clears blocked and disturbed emotions. So the healthy state of feeling confident, of feeling in a good mood, of feeling um, strong, that call it the healthy state. If that state isn't there, then you're in a blocked state when it comes mm-hmm. to you're blocking the healthy state, right? So feeling calm and happy and, a, and a in flow and um, creative, or whatever it is, this is us at our best. And to the extent that we're not there, we can think of that as a disruption in the healthy state or the Mm. The energy state is disrupted. And actually, that's how Bach flowers work. It's a disrupted energy state. There's other techniques also like energy psychology that work on that disrupted energy state to reduce fear and insecurity. I'll just give you an example. Um, I was pretty insecure (laughs) for a lot of my life and and anxious. So um, there's a technique in psychology that came out of the 1990s. Um, called energy psychology. We know it as emotional freedom technique is one of the main versions of it. Mm. And until I learned that technique, uh, I had been working and speaking publicly for 25 years before that. But each time that would be very hard on me. I would have like um, panic beforehand. Public speaking is actually the number one phobia of the, all the right. five. Right, right, right. Fear of death is number seven. Okay, so it's <laughs> <you crazy>. know, <laughs> So, so I would like suffer beforehand and then I would give a, a talk, which would be fine. Um, and then I'd have a migraine headache for 24 hours after that, just wow. from the strain of holding together for an hour. And that went on for 25 years, about two or three times a week. Okay. I never got better oh from gosh. the experience. Wow. Right. But I learned the tapping technique as part of my training and, you know, my ongoing, you know, professional development. And it cured me completely. It just mm. cured me completely. And that's an, also an energy-based technique like the Bach flower remedies. What's so the best way to can, read up on that? Or, or can you tell us more about that? I do. In my book, The Fear Fix, actually, yeah. there's a book called The Fear Fix that explains how to do that. But now there are all sorts of books on tapping. They might be called tapping books or um, EFT. But they involve tapping on meridian pathways. Uh, a couple of seconds of tapping, okay? Like, it's really amazing that this stuff works. It's yeah, I'm, fa- I'm like so blown away right now that that's like, like you're touching yourself and that's going to change the uh, I know. crazy. Wow. Hard to believe, but I can't do it. There's, there's, there's a lot of things like that. So in helping a child with um, a block, like, like well, how does the low self-esteem manifest, right? Is it a fear of doing something, a fear of making a telephone call, a fear of going out with, with kids? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we would address that. We could address those things best, to tell you the truth, with these energy techniques and with um, box flower therapies and things like that. Um, otherwise, we simply name the feeling which does help release it, okay? And give the kid uh, practice to become competent in something. But you see, like I said, 25 years of practicing public speaking didn't do it for me. Right, it's, right. Hmm. It's sometimes practice will do it to build the skill and the competence and, the, and now I know I can do it kind of thing. That does work sometimes for some people and for others, forget it. It's just not going to work. And what about when that's like causing a child to shut down? Meaning like the, the self-esteem or just like their timidness, whatever it is, is causing that child to just like always like shut down. Like I don't even want to try or I tried something and then like it didn't work and I'm like, get so upset. Disorder. And this is what my book, The Fear Fix, was about. Um, anxiety, really. It was avoidance increases anxiety. So if the child is now shut down and won't do anything, the anxiety gets stronger and stronger because mm-hmm. you ne- the, the wire never has a chance to, to heal. Like the, the brain is always like, that's dangerous. Um, I'm not doing it. And we never get beyond that. So we do need, that may need, depending on how shut down the kid is, a little bit of, you know, professional intervention as well to help the right. kid to manage. You have to keep the fear level at that's not overwhelming and then help the child move forward to experience a new experience of safety but it's multifaceted and right, if right. um it might be harder to get your hands on that book the fear fix but i say there's a million different techniques that we can use to come in um and each person will like one technique better than the other each child will respond better to one technique than the other so every technique in the sun is mentioned in that book the fear fix for that's, helping that's kids. your book the fear fix yes oh, it's, it's yeah. hard it's hard to get a hold of it might be um look around uh, for it um it depends i've seen it it comes and goes i don't know why that uh, one is not, it's not on amazon 
it is on Amazon uh, in Canada. Um, oh, interesting. In, U- in the U.S., I think it's a little harder to look. It. it was by HarperCollins Canada. Got and it, it's, got it. yeah, so it, it, I know people in the States have it and they get it, but be prepared to look around, maybe book depository or something, you know? Got it. Got it. Okay. That's good to know. What, and what about um, like in terms of anxiety? You know, like you were just mentioning anxiety. Are there things that parents can do or it really just if once a child's exhibiting real signs of anxiety, you have to go to outside help? Like, is, are there things that parents can do realistically? It's mostly what parents should do. <laughs> parents, <laughs> parents aid and abet anxiety terribly. Yeah. By helping the child avoid everything that would cure it. Thank you so, <laughs> so much for, for your time. This was incredibly insightful. And I, I hope that we'll have the time, another point to continue the conversation because you have so, so much to offer, so many insights. And I'll definitely be sharing all, all the books that we're able to get at least in yeah. our side over here. But maybe whoever's in Canada is listening too and, and they'll be able to get the books more easily. But uh, again, thank you so much for your time and uh, really, really thoroughly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs>